I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first session. Now, in the midst of global instability, how can we mitigate the effects of trauma on children, both at home and also at school? And you're going to be hearing from John Goodwin, CEO of the Lego Foundation, and Kate Robertson, co-founder of One Young World. So, Kate and John, over to you. Thanks so much for the introduction, Jordan. Yes, absolutely, it has arrived. Education is now officially the sexiest and most interesting of the sectors, and here we go. So, maybe some upside to the pandemic, you never know. Um, my organization, One Young World, exists for the sole purpose of finding, helping, promoting, connecting young leaders in every single country in the world. So not youth, but actually young leaders. And what we try to do is to make sure that we, at every opportunity, give our young leaders the chance to learn the things that they need to know so that they can lead for all of us toward a better world. And they are doing it all over the world. And many of them, we have 12,000 of them now at One Young World, many of them work on or in education in some form or another. So I know that this, these sessions are really important for them. And we get so caught up in the teaching of subject matter, both at school and at university, the credits you need, um, the tutorials that you need to attend, and the world of work. I certainly am of an age where I come from a, a story that is all about, you must work, you must work, work is, you must work hard, work, 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 work. Never the word play, never the word play. And of late, this became a, a work-life balance issue, which I always think if you're totally absorbed in your work and you love your work, um, work-life balance almost becomes not really that relevant. Um, but again, never discussing the word play. So peripherally, one learns about play and the value of play, particularly lately, it is a conversation that is growing. So when I got the chance to meet and um, engage with for this session for you today, the CEO of the Lego Foundation, I jumped at it. Because one thing we all know about Lego, these are the masters of the other four letter word, which is not work, the masters of play. So for me, really big deal to be on this session for you today with the CEO of the amazing Lego Foundation, John Goodwin. So hello to you, John. Hi, Kate. Hi. And thank you for COGEX for giving me the opportunity to participate today. It's great to be with you. Ah, terrific, John. John, um, we prepared our discussion because we had so much to talk about and so much that I know the world wants to hear from you. So I think we started off by looking at, you know, here we are, um, everybody needs to work, everybody needs their jobs, we need to get economies back up and running. So John, play? Why play? Let's talk about the importance of play. Over to you. Sure. Yeah, well, it was a great introduction you gave. And I think it's fair to say that sort of play is the work of the young mind. It's how children apply themselves into the world and help develop those neurological linkages that are going to be so important at the later stages of life. It's how they make meaning of what's around them. And uh, research has shown that it is a central uh, ability by which humans are able to construct those neurological pathways uh, that are so valuable in later life. Uh, maybe before uh, I get into uh, talking a little bit more about play, let me talk a little first about what the, who the LEGO Foundation are. The LEGO Foundation uh, owns 25% of the LEGO Group. And as the name would imply, we're a philanthropic organization uh, who, as I mentioned, receives uh, all of its funding uh, from the uh, Lego products, which you all consume. Uh, and what we do with that funding is we conduct research and we implement programs and we do advocacy around the world in order to help society change the, the view of play. And then uh, on the back of that, help them 
uh, reimagine your education systems in order to uh, create education systems that are much more uh, learner orientated so that people grow up to be creative, engaged, lifelong learners. And we're really passionate about that uh, because we believe in order to be effective contributors into society in the future, with the advent of things like artificial intelligence, robotics and manufacturing, uh, sorry, machine learning, it's really important that uh, we uh, are investing in developing uh, the human capabilities that can contribute into society that way. And we believe that learning through play is central to that. So maybe an important first point to answer your question is defining what is play. And play conjures up many images uh, around the world. And this is where we really started um, our recent journey as a foundation. We put in a lot of research in order to identify and establish what we mean by learning through play. So we worked with a lot of academic uh, thought leaders around the world, and through that, broke it down into five key characteristics, which if these characteristics are present, then that produces a really rich environment for children to learn. So those five characteristics are, is the activity that they're undertaking, is it actively engaging? Is it meaningful for the child? Is the child able to uh, make sense of what's going on? Is it joyful? That, that word means, uh, are they, have they got that engagement inside that allows them uh, to be optimum from an engagement point of view? Is it iterative? Uh, do they get the, a chance to try again and repeat and through that process get a deeper learning? And then finally, is it socially interactive? Do the children have an opportunity to share, whether it's with an adult or whether it's with a, uh, a fellow peer? So if those five characteristics, actively engaging, meaningful, joyful, iterative, and socially interactive, if they're present, then what we're, that's what we mean by learning through play. And our research has shown that is that is the best fora in which children are able to learn the critical skills that will enable them to fulfill their potential. The types of skills that the researchers indicate are developed through learning through play are social skills, cognitive, creative, emotional skills, and physical dexterity. You know, these skills are the tenants on which they manifest themselves into the higher order uh, skills that we're all expected to display in the workplace. So that is why we believe play is so important and so critical both now and in the future, uh, for children to have access to. John, when we talked earlier, um, you had when, when we were discussing exactly on this point, you brought out some statistics from your research, and I thought they were really about um, how much more ahead a person might be um, with all of this when they start school or they start formal, old-style learning. Give us some of those statistics because they were damn good. Well, what we were talking about is the importance, of, particularly of early childhood development, giving uh, young minds the opportunity to really get exposure to those learning through play environments in order to do the uh, neurological development that I was mentioning before. And some of the sad statistics about our education systems are that uh, depending upon um, where the, the child enters the education system, sadly, you know, where they are in the, in the quintiles of development, sadly, they tend to stay within that quintile throughout the whole of their education process. So the majority of children don't move up as a consequence of their education experience. Now, there's two things that I think that we need to take out of that. The first one is the importance of that early childhood development. Uh, the the fact that the brain does a huge amount of its, of its development in the first thousand uh, days of our existence. So um, development is not something that only occurs once children go into school, but it's really important that children are given the stimulated environment early on. So that's the first important take out of that. Uh, the second one is that whether or not there are current education systems are really geared towards where the child is at any one point in time. We're so fixated with dates and gates, you know, by this age they have to achieve this, by this age they have to achieve that, we're going to do this test then, we'll do this test then, and those tests are very structured, typically knowledge-based, and as a consequence of that, children 
don't get the opportunity to really adapt or get their, their learning process adaptive to where they are at any one point in time to be able to make the relevant moves for them up in those quintiles, but instead, sadly, they tend to stay uh, where they entered. You know, at the moment, with the um, particularly the generation with which my work is concerned, um, with millennials or Gen Z, as we now call them, coming through, um, one of the big words, and of course, the pandemic has 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 thrown this, it has highlighted this word, is resilience. And I think older generation, me, um, would look at young people and say, um, you must learn to be resilient. If you're not resilient, life will chuck things at you that you are not expecting and you will fall down and you won't get up again. You need to be resilient. I was really fascinated in your work talking about does play help people to become resilient and i thought that this for gen z is really going to be this is an such an important point that you make about play and its role in helping us to be resilient particularly young people yeah very much so and i, I think uh yeah depending upon your frame of reference you know, i've heard some people say well we just need to teach children to tough it out they just need to knuckle down and grind it through so uh, and there's somewhat of a, a, a sort of perverse view that if you make things really oppressive for children then the benefit of that is that they come out more resilient and certainly the data does not support that at all uh and what we've found is that the learning through play uh, activities and facilitation that's done by adults and teachers uh, really helps them build their social emotional learning, that resilience that we're talking about. Because through the exploration process of learning through play, children understand both how to interact with their peers but importantly, how to control their own emotions through that process. Mm -hmm. They learn uh, the whole concept of stress management and how it is that they don't allow the negative uh, emotions to overcome and take control of their behaviors, what's known as self-regulation. It helps them develop that capability, uh, which is at the heart of uh, coping mechanisms uh, enable them to continue their own learning and growth, uh, even though sometimes they get setbacks. Have you seen over this period of the pandemic people, young people being less resilient or more resilient? What do well, you think? the data would indicate that there's been, unfortunately, quite a lot of uh, emotional stress that's been generated for many children uh, around the world as a consequence of these changing circumstances. Obviously, there's been a huge variation of um, consequences of the, the global pandemic to children around the world. Uh, and the World Bank's published some data that, that indicates that for many children across the continent of Africa, uh, since the pandemic started, uh, they have had less than 50% of uh, learning opportunities than what they would normally have uh, in uh, the normal environment around the world. That's a huge um, deficit and loss uh, to their opportunities uh, to learn and growth. And how those children respond to that, again, is going to vary. Uh, but not surprisingly, the data would indicate uh, that unfortunately we're having a lot more instances of people, expert young children experiencing uh, depression and instances of uh, negative emotional development. So John, the Lego Foundation being as big and as, as, as powerful as it is, you're actually a power in this area, no question, you know, power with a capital P. But um, quite often I think a person working in the education space um, be it on work or play, is feeling that um, their work is not happening at scale. They they work with the pupils or the people that they play with. That's you know that that's it. It's a quite a sort of small. But given the world power that you are, 
tell us about the scale of your work. And I know I was really um, just amazed and edified to hear from you about your work at Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. But the Lego Foundation scale, looking at the map behind you there, is absolutely immense. Let's talk about scale of work. Yeah, so you mentioned the map behind me. We've got those little mini figures there just um, indicating the, where we've got activities on the ground in various countries around the world. Uh, we truly do have a, a global presence, and not to say that we're present in every country, but we do have activities in every continent. Uh, and we're, what we're seeking to do is find ways in which we can bring great learning and development opportunities uh, through learning through play to all children around the world, uh, but with a specific emphasis and focus on zero to 11 years old. So irrespective of the economic circumstances of the children around the world, we believe that there are ways in which learning through play can enable them uh, to fulfill their potential. Uh, so uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, we are operating in Cox's Bazaar on the Bangladesh Myanmar uh, border uh, there in, in that uh, refugee camp. Um, roughly a million people are there. And we have been uh, working with our partners on the ground, uh, called, a partner called BRAC, a wonderful uh, Bangladesh based uh, NGO that's providing early childhood development, primarily focused on children of three to six years old within the refugee camp. And they have shown, you know, we're on COGEX, they've shown amazing innovative capabilities through the pandemic. Because our normal implementation would be through BRAC and, uh, and our wonderful partners at Sesame Workshop, bringing great hands-on, minds-on um, play opportunities within the refugee camps through what we call play labs, which are like early childhood development centers where groups of uh, 15 to 20 uh, children come together and they're given stimulating opportunities through the course of the day. Now, unfortunately, as a consequence of the pandemic, our ability to send people out into the refugee camps has been significantly inhibited. Uh, but the innovative nature of both Sesame and uh, BRAC has uh, enabled them to pivot and they've used the resources that are available within the refugee camp. In this case, it's radio uh, in order to provide those uh, fun learning opportunities uh, for the children within the camp, which they then do in their various homes with their parents. You're fantastic. You brought in tech now and we had a discussion earlier about um, play online and play offline and you had a view and um, very clearly backed by research of play online and its value and it's not only play offline or only the other way around what do you think what do you know yeah. john you're the one who knows <laughs> <laughs> totally you know this is the subject matter that gets a, a lot of attention and consumes a, a lot of parents minds because i know i'm often asked about it you know, should I uh, allow my four-year-old any time in front of my iPad or tablet device? And, you know, our point of view is that digital play is still play if it contains the five characteristics that I was uh, talking about before. And we've recently released uh, a research piece that's called Learning Through Digital Play. And uh, the, the sort of bottom line is that you can have those five characteristics that I talked about that give you that rich learning environment, they can be present digitally just as well as they can physically. Uh, so I think the important thing for us to look at is, is the digital engagement of the child really one that allows them to have the agency, allows them uh, to be creative? Are they able to get some guidance in order to help them on their journey. So we have to look at the methodology of engagement. So some great examples, uh, we've worked with uh, Scratch, it's a program language developed by MIT in Boston. And uh, now it has its own Scratch Foundation. Amazing, I think it's over 600 million children around the globe are active Scratch users. And it's a coding language 
where children can learn how to create their own programs. And what's wonderful about it is they've created a community where children help other children solve their specific problems. And it's amazing the collaboration skills that are developed through that engagement. So it's very different to the sort of image that we have of a child sitting very passively in front of a screen, just absorbing. You know, that's not the active engagement that we should be seeking. We should be seeking to use the digital device as a means of really getting the child actively engaged, iterating, doing all of those five characteristics that I was talking about before. This is so of the moment, isn't it, John? There's a question in here um, which says, how long will it take for us to realize that education today is only appropriate for about 20% of the population? Can we change the system? Mm. Yeah, well, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I, would definitely, I would definitely hope that the answer is yes, because that's what we, uh, that's what we uh, intend to do within the, the Lego Foundation. Um, but you know, I think it is fair to say that education systems are the archetypal wicked problems. Um, you know, the wicked problems are defined as those types of societal challenges that are multifaceted and have many stakeholders. So in order to move them onto a different trajectory and plane, you have to operate on all of those stakeholders in a way that they are willing and able to participate in the transition. So if you think about it, in your education, you've got the governments involved. You've got the whole education system, the people setting the curriculum, the people setting how it is that it's going to be measured and monitored. You've got the teachers, you've got the uh, leaderships within schools, you've got the governance structures. Uh, you also have parents as big stakeholders. So there's many uh, activities that you have to influence in order to get that transition. But we are working with our partners around the globe uh, to work directly with governments, uh, and with implementers in order to get that movement taking place. You know, many education systems were really designed for the world 100 years ago when we were an industrialized society looking to create people with a base level of knowledge that would enable them to participate in an industrial world. Now we're in the, you know, the fourth industrial revolution where the areas of participation that humans are going to have to bring are much more aligned to those sort of um, creative, collaborative, uh, emotional connections that are unique to humans. And we really need to adapt our education systems to enhance those capabilities. And what we feel passionate about is generate a love of learning. You know, learning is not about jumping a set number of hurdles at a certain stage in your life. And then when you're 18, 21, 24, you're done. You put books aside and then you're off in contributing. You know, what everything is saying this is that we've constantly got to reskill ourselves now because the environment's changing so rapidly. So we have to have a love of learning and we have to understand how to learn. And that's where we believe our education systems need to adapt in order to embrace that. Is it controversial to ask you, John, um, and let's stay stay on the positive side here. Um, to give our our people, the audience around the world, um, are there a couple of countries whose system is is kind of towards getting it right? Nobody's perfect. Where would where would we look for examples? Well, I would say there's many countries around the world that are making great interventions at this point in time in order to move uh, their education systems more to in line with what I was saying. I think there's a lot of um, a data to support that a number of the Scandinavian countries have, have yeah. embraced this type of uh, approach to education uh, for many years. Uh, so some of the examples would be that teachers are held in quite high esteem. Oh, yes. uh, throughout yes. the, the society. And that's an important component. Yeah. Um, they also give uh, teachers a lot of agency in the classroom. What that means is that they're uh, not restricting 
the the teacher and forcing them to uh, do uh, a certain pedagogical approach or a certain curricula that's like micromanaged, but instead they're giving the, the teacher latitude to be able to adjust to the pupil that's uh, there in the classroom with them. And the other thing is that their measurement and monitoring systems are a bit more holistic. They're not all based on a high stakes exam at a certain point in the child's life, uh, but instead they have more of an ongoing monitoring process that enables, again, children to flourish at different stages in their lives and also flourish in different ways. You know, we're not all great at just absorbing vast amounts of data and then regurgitating it within a set period of time. But what I would say is in my 35 years of work life, I've never once been appraised in the workplace on the basis of sitting down at the end of the year and doing a three-hour three exam to prove what I've done. You know, people are appraised in the workplace on the basis of their active contributions through the course of the year. And we believe there's opportunities to translate that across into education systems too. I think you made such a, you know, one, one of your points earlier, it's such an interesting reference because if I look to my generation where everything was, education was about work and the world of work and preparing one for work and do the work first and you can play later, um, that that kind of sort of um, actually rigid approach. But I can't think of many points in those days in education where creativity, and I mean that in the broadest sense, was held in great esteem and now so serious and interesting to see the divide between education systems where, as you say, a teacher may have agency, where creativity is encouraged and, and, and the spirits are let loose to be creative versus education systems where everything is about the exam, everything is about making sure that you've passed exams at the highest possible um, scientific level by the time you're 15 and preferably in university and going on to study further by the time you're 16. And mm -hmm. increasingly there are numbers of these. And I just wonder if we don't in that way produce cannon fodder for the fourth mm. industrial revolution. Mm. And we forget the creative side. If you look at Pfizer BioNTech and those two genius mm. Turkish scientists who developed the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, that story is probably one of the most creative stories I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, totally. Wonderful illustration, uh, I think. Um, but it, it also is, is at the essence of the creative process. You know, for uh, any of you that have been around uh, or worked in uh, processes that require a high degree of creativity, yeah, it, they're rarely, you know, those creative insights are rarely generated on the basis of, right, you, sit down, be creative, now. You know, that, that, sort, of, uh, that sort of intensity rarely stimulates. Yeah. The, the connections in the brain that allows us to uh, generate breakthrough. And that's unfortunately uh, so much of our education system is geared towards that. You know, the, the, the late Ken Robinson you know, gave one of the oh. most viewed uh, TED Talks of all time. And for those of you yeah. that haven't seen it, I would recommend you go in and look, uh, look it up around whether education systems are killing creativity in society. Uh, now, that was, I think that was over a decade ago uh, that yes. Ken uh, yes. gave that speech. But so few education systems around the world have really uh, embraced the tenets of what's there and started to think through, OK, how can we purposefully enable the development of creativity uh, across our education systems um, with with much more intention. Yeah, absolutely. John, there's a question that's come up um, twice now. So the, who's asking it is obviously anxious for an answer. Um, saying is customized one-to-one -one mentoring helpful? Oh, well, for sure it is helpful if the if the mentor is well trained in facilitation. We have uh, uh, another research paper that talks about the the process of 
uh, facilitating learning through play in the classroom and talks about a continuum of uh, some instances where it's very appropriate for the teacher to take a fairly instructional, informative uh, role like the ones that we would typically associate with teachers. But then there's a continuum because there are circumstances where the teacher should step out of the learning experience and allow the children and the child to do the self-discovery because that leads to much deeper learning and connections uh, for that particular individual. Uh, so, and if you think about what we then experience in later life, a lot of the um, more successful companies around the world have very active mentoring systems in order to enable us to develop at the pace that's meaningful for the learner, extracting the knowledge and insights and experiences of the facilitator, but then also enabling the facilitator to allow our own depth of learning depending upon how we learn best. Uh, because as humans, we typically have uh, quite different uh, learning preferences. So that mentoring is a great way of doing it. However, it is uh, quite intense. So the uh, ability to be able to have sort of one-on-one -on -one mentoring in most education systems around the world is uh, fairly limited. However, uh, having the ability to uh, vary your approach within the classroom, we've seen is um, still an option even when you have one to 60 ratios of teachers uh, to uh, pupils. Uh, so you know, we're not putting forward here uh, an impractical solution that can only be applied in very uh, rich um, countries, but instead really looking to find ways in which this sort of mentoring facilitation can uh, be implemented in a wide array of circumstances. Extraordinary. So, John, if I think about my community of these, these 12,000 brilliant young leaders in every single country in the world, just to your point, um, obviously not all of them in the in rich countries where one on one mentoring is available, but I know that they will want to take on these lessons that you're bringing us about play and its relationship to resilience. So for them to access, for example, the work of the Lego Foundation, what would you recommend as their best, um, obviously online, but what should they look at? What should they look to? Because I know that they they are hungry for this. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for that, uh, that uh, question, Kate. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, we have um, our resources posted online. So go to legofoundation.com. Uh, all of the research that we conduct is open sourced. We're really looking to uh, bring the insights of learning through play to everybody around the world. Um, and I should have mentioned at the start as well, you know, with the Lego Foundation, we have uh, a, a, a complete open mind with regards to uh, the modes of play. We, we define the five characteristics and we believe that that can be achieved through a wide modicum of facilitation, not just through the, the great Lego bricks that are the source of our funding. I would also say that we uh, developed online courses. We've recently launched a, a MOOC, a massive uh, open online course on social emotional development because we realized uh, the, the need to get out there uh, the uh, knowledge and, and capabilities uh, to enable uh, people that are given the stewardship of, of children as part of their responsibility, uh, the ability to learn about how it is that they can develop uh, social and emotional learning. Uh, so please go and, and sign up on that course. It's uh, completely free and um, we'd love to have you participating. Oh, that's fantastic, John, really is. You know what makes me think of when you listen over this time of pandemic to these 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 magical magical scientists um or you listen to people who've become um who work in astrophysics and and um astronomy but i found it so interesting to listen to these these people who really have changed the world when they talk about their personal journey as it were using the j word it's so interesting when you hear them say 
oh, you know, and I was a child and my dad, my dad showed me that or an auntie who so told me it worked like that. And I just fell in love with that. I just fell in love with that. And we don't talk that way about the world of work very often. We may sometimes talk about it as play, but listening to you, it seemed to me that really that's what we want for children. And children love play. That's an easy thing for them to fall in love with. Isn't it so? Totally, totally. And and as I say, we, we've really got to disconnect ourselves from the historical paradigm that play is the thing that gets, you only do that when all the important stuff is done. You know, nothing could be further from the truth uh, for younger children. As I mentioned, it is the work of the young mind. It's the way that children research. It's the way they innovate. And we have to allow children space to be able to learn through play. And oh, really I love break that. this belief that you've got to sit them down at the earliest possible stage and drill them with all of the knowledge they're going to need for the future. It's like, no, that is not what the young mind needs. It needs to nurture a love of learning. And learning through play is the best way to do that. So let us, um, I'm going to come back to you, John, for a, for a wrap up. But I just want to call out the thing that you just said. Play is the work of the young mind. I love that. This play is the work of the young mind. Let us quote you into eternity. So, John, Back to you for and wrap up our session. Yeah, well, thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, learning through play. You know, it's uh, great to have the opportunity to talk to the COGX community. Um, I think you know, given the, the technology focus, uh, there's a temptation to believe that there is this silver bullet out there in the context of a single app that's going to transform uh, the learning or education systems around the world. And we would say, whilst technology is great uh, and can be a facilitator, it always needs to come with great facilitation. And as I mentioned, what we need to look out, the, out for are those five characteristics of learning through play, because through that, you're really enabling uh, the neurological development and the creation of lifelong learners. Well, this should be our mission to get everybody to understand my young leaders all around the world everybody at cogx play is vital it is the work of the young mind and with that from john from lego foundation from me at one young world our thanks both of us um to cogx and to the organizers and to audience online thank you go and play